Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Hello and welcome to another episode of the Chai Time Data Science Show. In this episode, I interview Evan Aldridge, who is a senior applied research scientist at NVIDIA, currently working on the Rapids AI team. We talk all about Evan's journey into the field. Evan has been working in the data science field for over the past decade now. Evan is also one of the faces and my peers from the Fast.ai community. We talk. all about his journey into fast ai his thoughts around the course best and many best advices for people just taking up the course and following the top down way of learning new things we also talk a lot about his current work at rapids ai what rapids ai is currently working on including multiple projects cudf cuml cu graph and all of the little projects that sit inside of the rapids ai repository you can find the links to them in the description of this podcast if you want to check them out we also talk about research and applied research open source fast ai and deep learning all of these themes in this single interview rapids ai is working on many interesting things if you want to check those out you can find links in the description of this podcast a quick note to the listeners this interview with all of the future ones will have properly checked and he uploaded subtitles so if you're a non native english speaker please enable the subtitles on youtube if you're watching it on youtube and i hope that helps your experience along with the written version or the blog post version of this interview which will come out in a few days or in a few weeks from the video release so you can find link to the website where this will be released in the dis- in the description of this podcast as well for now here's my interview with even aldridge all about applied research fast ai and rapids ai please enjoy the show Hi everyone I'm on the call with Even Aldridge Even thank you so much for joining me on the podcast series Thanks for having me son I'm super excited to be a part of this I've been a fan since it was a a series of blog posts and uh, it's always great to meet with another fast ai family member I've been a fan of you through the fast ai family as i call it because <laughs> you're not really known to the person you just see the little icons but it's an honor to have you on the show No I'm super excited to be here So uh you currently working as a senior applied research scientist at Nvidia and you have been working in the research and data science domain for almost a decade now could you tell the re- uh, listeners how did you get started in data science and how did deep learning start to come into the picture for you Yeah so I was lucky enough uh to go through an engineering degree and get interested in machine learning and AI very early on Um I can remember in my undergrad uh taking a course in neural nets and and I ended up almost doing a it was a graduate level course and I almost did a masters under this prof. Um I was super interested in this obscure project which was this like it was called the RoboConeco and somebody was building a a robot brain for cats essentially. Okay. Um and they were building it the hardware they were building it on was these this sort of a uh, piece of hardware called a field programmable gate array. It's like a programmable machine. It's they they're still around um they kind of lost mm-hmm. the general purpose computing more to gpus um but uh they it was a really interesting kind of uh, uh hardware platform and I, there was a great professor nearby that i ended up going into my masters at there okay. um but from there i ended up i took a year off after my masters and wanted to take a break i did a a, a bunch of uh, photography and actually was working as a photographer 
Um, and from that, is your work I'm still sure. available somewhere online? Can we go check it out? Yeah, I have, I have a few with well, the photography. I haven't put anything online, but I, I, I do have a bunch of art online. Um, I can send you the links. It's uh, yeah, we'll uh, have it linked in the description. Brokenheart.com is one of them and flowform.com. And, uh, it's, it, that's more of the painting stuff, but, okay. but yeah, art doesn't really pay the bills, unfortunately. <laughs> um, and I had a, a professor at UBC who reached out that was, you know, he was doing kind of com computational photography and, you know, and computer vision. Uh, this is all sort of pre deep learning. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty old at this stage <laughs> for, for that side of things. So, you know, when I learned uh, machine learning and, and like the computer vision side of things, it was all SIFT features and, you know, you built the features kind of yourself and then the representations downstream. And um, it was a, a PhD in the intersection between uh, human computer interaction and, um, and computer vision. Um, mm -hmm. And then I did some teaching after that uh, in sort of interactive arts and in um, just a variety of undergrad classes just to pay the bills. And eventually got hired at um, Plenty of Fish, which is an online dating site, uh, mm -hmm. one of the biggest in the world, uh, and worked there heading up the research team. Uh, and we were developing matching algorithms using neural nets, doing some pretty cool stuff actually there, like distributed neural net systems across, you know, uh, a few hundred thousand dollars worth of NVIDIA hardware um, okay. at using Slurm. And it, we basically uh, sort of wrote our own version of TensorFlow and had this whole system going to distribute training. And, and yeah, it was, it was pretty, pretty crazy, pretty complex and, and a lot of fun. Um, and this was before like we had these uh, convenient algorithms that you could easily distribute across hardware. Yeah, it wasn't, I mean, Slurm and there's some other techniques just for distributing and, and, and kind of managing clusters and managing jobs and scheduling that I think mm -hmm. they're still in use today, but okay. um, we leveraged those. And then, uh, yeah, it was, it was from there, I kind of, things shifted when we were bought by match.com and, you know, and, and it wasn't as like, punchy and startup -y and and uh, the work I was doing there was, you know, was less and less satisfying as things went on. And mm -hmm. so I took some time off and that was the moment when I discovered fast AI and, and okay. really got into the, the deep learning journey that I, I'm on now. So. Got it. Yeah. We'll talk more about fast day, but I'm curious, <laughs> you had the, had your start of the career in the re applied research uh, domain, if I may, uh, what made you pick that as a role, uh, did you have any interest towards that? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I would call what I was doing at Plenty of Fish Applied Research. It was more sort of traditional machine learning. Like we were building uh, matching algorithms and fraud detection systems and, you know, really trying to like understand social user bases. And it was research because there wasn't a lot of people doing things at that level. And a lot of the, the work there is sort of on user bases and databases and, and stores of data that just aren't accessible. It's one of the interesting challenges of recommendation. You know, I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very interested in that side of things and, and currently kind of actively studying it as well. But data sets for recommendation are, are rare and hard to come by and they don't really mimic the sort of the real world recommendation problems that, that you know, that people are facing when they're building recommender systems for production. <laughs> so yeah, it's a very interesting uh, dichotomy there. Mm -hmm. Now, coming to fast AI, you started your fast AI path, if I may, in, uh, I believe, 2016. Yes. And could you tell us how the journey has been for you? Because I think you've taken all of the fast AI offerings since then, and you've taken it both in person and online. So also, if I may, a comparison of both. Yeah. I, so all of mine have been as international fellows. So it's all okay. been um, sort of online, but live, which I find makes actually a big difference. I took the very first part one I took on my own. Um, okay. And I did that, you know, uh, I discovered Fast AI after it had been posted and, and Jeremy shared it. And I sort of blasted through that course. It was at the perfect time. Like I just left Plenty of Fish. I was taking the time to really kind of figure out what I wanted to do. And I actually, you know, I, I was at this dichotomous point where I was trying to figure out if I wanted to get into ML engineering and sort of get deeper into that side of things or if I wanted to kind of, you know, double down on the data science, but I wasn't loving the data science I was doing at the time was more on the analytics side and mm -hmm. less on the machine learning. And I was much more interested in machine learning. And then, okay. yeah, fast AI came on along at just the perfect time. And I, I sort of, I worked really hard in about a month to finish part one in order to qualify for part two. 
and I, okay. you know, I applied for part two um, and uh, and took that as an international fellow that year. And I've taken every fast AI offering since then, um, and look forward to the the coming years program. I find it's it's just such a good <laughs> refresher, and and you know, there's always something new and something yeah. interesting, something different. And you know, Jeremy and El Saban are like they work so hard to update the libraries and change things up that it's you know you, you kind of have to enroll in the course and be a part of it to stay up to date in my mind so yeah quick plug uh, if you want if you're curious how they develop the library i've already interviewed jeremy on the series so do check that interview out from the description nice i'm looking forward to that one <laughs> so uh, you've been uh, one of the faces of the family as i call it because as i said like these there are these little icons that become hyperactive during the international fellowship there's a lot of discussion that happens and i was going through your profile you spent about five days worth of <laughs> reading time on the forums yeah. in in throughout the three years worth of visits could you tell us how your approach to learning the material has changed because uh, even your comments and th this is an active discussion in fast year about how do you actually learn fast year because the material is yeah. completely different from anything yeah no for me the the so i'll give you the kind of the key to to learning for me that that really helped and this was you know, I posted on the Fast Day forum and, and shared it, but I'll share it here again. Um, there's so much depth to what's being offered, right? Like Jeremy in a two hour lecture is covering so many topics and so many ideas and there's so much follow up that you could do to it um, that it's just, you know, this, it's this massive bundle of content that you're kind of getting. I find, you know, like when I watch it, I'm lucky if I get a third of it, right? So. Mm -hmm. What I find is watching it through once to get the visuals and to build up the understanding is really helpful. Um, and I try and do that, but I also try and download it as an MP3 or as a, like an audio file. And mm -hmm. then I stick it on my phone and whenever I'm, you know, I'm traveling or, or I used to have an hour's commute to work. I'm, I'm now at home full time and, and kind okay. of doing the work from home thing, which I really love. But in that hour there and back in my biking commutes, I would listen to, to Jeremy and, and it was funny. It would be like, you know, you'd, you'd get these ideas in your head as you're listening. It got to the point where hearing his voice was enough to start simulating ideas for me. And I'd listen and listen and listen. Then I hear something and I would just zone out. And then suddenly I would snap back to reality and I'm, you know, I'm there in this moment biking along. And I would literally, there was a half dozen times in my, in my commute back and forth where I would pull off to the side, get out my notebook out of my bike bag well, and start frantically scribbling notes because I just had this, you know, this idea that popped into my head from what he's talked about. <laughs> so that really helped. Um, I was a lot more involved in the forums back then. I wish I had the time to be more involved now. Um, you know, uh, NVIDIA takes a lot of time. I do plan to get, get more involved. I, I'm, I've got two small boys and that's kind of, you know, uh, family eats up a lot of time and it's you know it's it's where I drive a lot of my pleasure in life too so it's you know it's it's a wonderful thing but it, it means I can't be as involved as I'd like to be you know especially with the, yeah. the age that they're at I'm, you know one's four and the other's just turning one and so it's okay it's a lot of hands-on involvement maybe in the future offerings you'll be back on the forums in a while yeah I hope so for sure how has your approach about learning uh, the material specifically changed in terms of how much time do you spend coding versus, uh, mm -hmm. so Jeremy advises us to replicate the notebooks, what approaches did you take there? Did you try Kaggle competitions, any other? Yeah, so honestly, the thing that really made it stick for me was picking a project that was outside the bounds of fast AI. Like I've done the notebooks and you know, it's so hard not to shift enter through them. And even <laughs> when you're kind of rewriting them, it's like, you've got this cheat sheet and I'm bad when I've got that, that I'll just kind of go over. So the thing that really kind of clicked it for me was actually, it was a mix of Kaggle. So I, like, I'm, I've been interested in tabular uh, deep learning for a long time um, mm -hmm. through Jeremy's stimulation there. But um, if you look on the Kaggle forums, there's all sorts of interesting solutions related yep. to tab tabular that I've posted on some of my previous blog posts. And you know, one of them was a, a denoising autoencoder, which I thought was just this really interesting idea that I wanted to try out. So figuring out how to do that from, you know, from start to finish in fast AI, you know, with all the different layers and all the different complexities. And I think the library back then was a bit more complex. Like I think I wrote it during the 0 0.7 
<laughs> version. Um, I'm looking forward to rewriting it for 2.0 when it comes out. I think it's going to be a lot easier to write. Um, yeah. I'm hoping so. Because um, yeah, back in 0 0.7, there was many layers of abstraction. And so you had to make sure that all those interlocking pieces kind of work together if you wanted to do something custom and outside the bounds of the library. But mm -hmm. what that meant was that I, I really had to like dig in and go deep to learn the whole library through and through. And so I've spent a lot of time poking around the, the fast AI code base and, and the stack there and, and, you know, figuring it out. And Jeremy and, and Sylvan have a very particular style of programming that, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit challenging, I think, for a lot of people when they first get introduced to it, at least I found it personally very challenging mm -hmm. um, to build up that mental representation. And, and it's sort of like this, this, wall that you have to get over and then yeah. once you're inside it's this beautiful city of possibilities right so it's i think once you get used to it it's it's a mind opening experience then you're really conveniently able to navigate through the code yeah. base well and i like to seeing the evolution of the code over the the you know the last two iterations has really helped me understand a lot and i'm like i what i want to spend most of my time on over the next little while you know in terms of fast ai is really coming to understand the like that the programming methodologies and and like part two last year some of the deep learning fundamentals is yeah you know, it, it's so critical to know those things and to understand them um yeah i've got like like i said earlier before the the call i'm not the best math person um and so it really like for me to understand it looking at code kind of helps a lot mm -hmm. and you know, and, and understanding that side of things, reading papers. I'm, I'm lucky enough to come from an academic background so I can read the papers and kind of, you know, get a basic understanding of them. But many times, you know, I'll, I'll read the paper and, and I'll, I'll, you know, have a very high level understanding and I won't really understand the depth of it. And it's, it takes, again, you know, dedication and multiple rereadings. And there's so many papers coming out all the time. And <laughs> I've, I've got a stack of papers on my desk right now, all related to, you know the the newest stuff that came out from uh the the lottery ticket hypothesis yeah. right like there's been what four new like facebook put out three new papers and google put out a new paper that they're promoting and yeah it's like just trying to understand all the implications of that and specification of deep learning is a pretty interesting concept um, there's been some really awesome work on embeddings recently that I'm trying to understand and get into. And yeah. Thankfully, I was able to find the source code for that. So this, like, that's one of those things where, like, if I can look at the code, I think Jeremy sense. talks about this too. It's like, yeah. you know, if you've got the paper and you got the code, then suddenly you can see that, like, what takes up three pages in the paper and involves a hundred formulas <laughs> is actually four bits of code. Yeah, <laughs> and they're describing it in this weird way. And yeah, and yeah I, I encountered that. There's some there's some really good papers that run counter to that too. That are you know they're trying for simplicity. And the papers that I've written, I've tried certainly mm -hmm. to write them more along that style in the blog post. So I'm hoping to get back to more academic and more paper writing and that side of things for sure. Okay. To put the date into perspective for the papers, for the audience, uh, this podcast was recorded in the last week of November. So if you're curious about when the papers came out, but I am, I want to ask you, like many people uh, have this question on the community, how do they find this idea first? And secondly, how do they like, because for many people, FASTA is the first coding plus machine learning course. So it's really difficult to connect the dots to the external projects after even finding them. So any best advices you have for that? Yeah, I think, I mean, finding something you're really interested in and passionate about, and it could be something as simple as like, you know, something you like to take pictures of that you build a classifier for, or, I mean, there's a bunch of really good examples. I think passion is a really key aspect to it. Um, you know, like Jason's work on Deoldify. Yeah. Or, um, Helena's uh, work on... Yeah, I just work on Gans. It's amazing. I'm I'm a, such a huge, huge fan of. I mean, she really got me deeply into the interactive art scene, and I'm a fan of a whole bunch of people's there within yeah. that context. But, and there's a few more like there's um, oh her name's uh, eluding me. Uh, they she's she's done a bunch of beautiful work on audio. I think she's a Google Christine. I know. Yes. Yes. Christine's um, been on the podcast also, so a shameless plug again. Do check perfect. check the episode out. <laughs> yeah, she's she's fantastic, and her work is is stunning. And it's yeah, it's like these projects that derive from your passions. I think really help. Um, you know, it, even it, Andrew Shaw, another example who 
figured out how to create a chain smokers song remix using deep learning <laughs> yeah that was super cool um i i really love that piece as well um yeah, yeah I, so, i reached out to him to see if i could get him onto my my team at nvidia but uh jeremy had already snatched him up so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh how once we find these projects uh how should we go about learning the things that we need to connect to them especially for kaggle competitions because the fast ai library cannot be just picked up and applied to them you have to sort of figure out these helper functions every now and then yeah i mean kaggle's a good example too of where so kaggle's tricky like if you want to apply this to kaggle there's you know there's so many aspects about kaggle that aren't like especially for tabular which is my area of expertise you know the feature engineering is a huge component of of winning a tabular kaggle competition um mm. and uh you know and then beyond that there's there's a huge like there's a bunch of different techniques that you need to know like stacking and boosting and ensembling and and like how to combine models in an intelligent way that you know without those you're not going to place silver um so it's i don't i don't necessarily recommend um kaggle as a like it, it depends on the degree to which you're competitive um yep. and and if you want to just you know participate and and try it out then then that's great um and how many nights of sleep are you ready to lose also yeah time? it's like you know the the one kaggle competition that i've seriously um uh, worked on the the champs scalar coupling um was a, a lot of late nights and and sleepless work and a lot of hard work and and you know and I wasn't even the primary person working on it it was we had a an amazing intern Sarah Rabi who was you know she was doing most of the heavy lifting there and really just taking a lot of the kind of the ideas and the iteration that I was working on you know with her and trying to figure out so yeah it's it's kaggle can get so all consuming and so full time Um, yeah i think you know for a first project i would recommend something you know simpler something more you know more um to your interest and and that just comes down to like at the end of the day the 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 fundamental thing you need to do a deep learning project at this stage is data yeah. right like fast ai will give you everything else that you need so you just really need to kind of figure out well what is the kind of data you want to work on is it you know is it images that's pretty straightforward it's a lot of examples there is it you know video that's getting mm-hmm. a little more complex and a little more fun and you know and then is it audio there's some interesting stuff there and yeah. you know do you want to do you want to do gans do you want to do like my my first fast ai project that i really got into um was in part 2 i was sort of drive from my art was the tra- uh, the the style transfer i got super into that and started playing around with different methods for style transfer and you know really got deep into it for for the the sort of the mm-hmm. bulk of the course Okay. So, yeah, find something you're passionate about. That's that's my main advice. I definitely agree because the passion will definitely reduce your frustration or make you feel lesser of it because machine learning or deep learning right now is very frustrating and yeah. you need to be able to get through all of that frustration before you get that output. I can't remember who was describing it to me this way or maybe it was even on your podcast but it sort of deep learning it doesn't work and it doesn't work and it doesn't work and it doesn't work. and then it works you know it's not <laughs> like it's not like this steady progress i mean once it works you can kind of get into that steady progress mode but there's a lot of it doesn't works before it really starts to like yeah. take off and and, and look <laughs> beautiful or perform well or whatever else definitely do you think your uh, if i may traditional machine learning and engineering background was helpful for fast ai or any advice for someone coming from this background because this is a bottom up approach that we used to and fast ai takes a different approach any yeah. advice for such people i mean for me it was it was really refreshing like i love this style of of approach and the style of teaching i've always been a big fan of you know this is the really powerful cool thing you can do with this and let's learn you know learn that and and take that direction um you know I'm, like i'm coming from an ml period prior to deep learning so it's a bit different and the like the stuff i studied in school was you know was all replaced like you you could do it's a one line function now <laughs> oh yeah you you could do you know the half of my thesis that was machine learning based you could you could literally write in in a handful of lines with the right data set you know mm-hmm. like and, and and probably i'm sure you could get much better accuracy than i did you know at the end of the day 
Yeah. It was, uh, yeah. And so, you know, I'm not sure that that advice is particularly relevant, but from a programming perspective, having a programming background, I think, you know, definitely helped. I think <laughs> if you really want to get more complex than what the library already currently does, um, which is sort of, in my mind, where, where things get really interesting and fun, right, is, is when you can kind of tweak the library to do things it's not meant to do. Mm -hmm. That's that you kind of need to spend some time learning programming. And I think Jeremy's done a bunch of really awesome podcasts or uh, um, video casts on that recently where he's just yeah. like walking through the library and doing some live coding. And, um, Those are more dense than the really part helpful. two. So yeah. please take that with a grain of salt. Yeah, it's really, it's it's definitely high level. Like you need to be, It's it don't take that to learn like a language from a beginner's perspective. This is more for the people with a, like a programming and machine learning background. Yep. Just understand his, his way of programming and, and that style, yeah. That's, that's great advice. So before we talk about your current role, I think there was a connect for your current job through the forums as well. Maybe you could speak more to that, but I remember you had posted about <laughs> rapids on the forums and later on I saw Joshua commenting on there. So was there a connect for NVIDIA through the forums or is there a story behind that? There's so I didn't actually get um, connected to Rapids through Josh or through the forums. I was in super interested in Rapids and, and in what it could do and, and you know and chatting with him. Like I I think I might have even been the one who originally posted it to the forums because yes. I thought it was cool. Um, and uh, yeah, I I got really into Rapids, but I honestly when I first applied for the role, I didn't even realize that it was for Rapids specifically. Um, okay. And it was one of those strange things where I, um, it was on Twitter and, and it just like my current boss posted it as a like, hey, we're looking for people to, to study tabular deep learning and recommender systems. And I just like a light bulb <laughs> went off in my head of like, I can do this full the time. Dots connected oh my for God, you. it's amazing, right? Like, so maybe to continue my journey a little bit, because we just talked about the fast AI side of things. Um, I ended up with that sort of knowledge in fast AI and the recommender systems and the deep learning passion. I got really into, uh, or I got, I, I got a role at realtor.com and mm -hmm. there, you know, was very interested in doing deep learning based recommenders and that side of things. And we did some pretty interesting systems there um, and, and tried to scale that up. And I got, you know, a lot of the work was kind of in my 10% time of like, you know, I'm, I'm super interested in doing this, but, you know, for us to deploy this to production isn't reasonable, you know, isn't feasible right now. So mm -hmm. there's like, we've got to do the stuff to get things into production, but, you know, and, and I was trying to like lead the team and I had a bunch of amazing interns who then, you know, we hired on and, and got to work with them on this. And one of them, uh, Angela Tao, we worked together on um, on a paper that we never ended up publishing. We may end up okay. going through, but it's like basically analyzing the fast AI model and the denoising autoencoder and a bunch of other tabular models to see what level of performance we could hit um, relative to like to CAPUS and to you know, XGBoost and LGBM and those types mm -hmm. of models. And, and it was pretty interesting to see the level of performance we could achieve with, with proper hyperparameter tuning and, and you know, some of these techniques, like the, the denoising aspect of the denoising autoencoder. It's basically doing a, like a shuffle of the data within the column. And so you're dealing with real world data and the models having to learn these distributions within that context. And it's, you know, you can get very similar levels of performance uh, across the different, uh, different types. Um, and it's it's one of those interesting challenges. We like we basically got to the point where we we looked at submitting it to KDD, but by the time we got to the the point for submission, um, so we were comparing. Uh, we're get, getting into the technical weeds here of tabular deep learning. I hope that's okay. Um, but we were we were comparing to CatBoost, and CatBoost is you know it, it, it's a really interesting, great library focused. Uh, it does some some really powerful things for categorical variables. Mm -hmm. um, and the metric that they were using for comparison on these uh, was the, the RMSE error, or it might be log, log RMSE. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, the, for a lot of these data sets, there was, you know, such a level of imbalance and such a, like, yeah. when you compare that value to accuracy, like what we were seeing in the deep learning models, uh, you know, in terms of like, you know the, the the ROC curves and the the precision recall ROC and 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 those were, you know, uh, you could find, like basically we were we were hitting points where there was this sort of this steady improvement in performance, of accuracy relative to this this RMS year, and and then it would hit this point where you hit this threshold and then after that 
you know, you're, you're basically past the point of, of performance improvements and you're just hitting this noisy saturation. Exactly. Well, beyond saturation, it just sort of, you, you, like, it was almost like overfitting. And okay. I like, we were doing the experiments within the deep learning side of things. So we couldn't tell, like I could get models that, that sort of matched or, you know, came very close to the cat boost errors. But th when we looked at kind of the, the accuracy of those models, the precis precision recall curves, they weren't as good as the best ones we could get by dialing it back and looking for that sort of lesser target. And it's one of the interesting challenges within the field, I think is, you know, like optimizing for a metric that isn't aligned with, you know, your end goal. And I mean, you can't, yeah. you can't optimize for accuracy. That's not like, that's not something you can target. You can't optimize for you know, precision or recall because it's just too noisy, <laughs> right? It's not, a, yeah. there's no loss landscape there. So you have to deal with these, um, these sort of different loss functions, but that's been something that I've explored and spent a lot of time looking into as well. Again, connecting the dots for the audience. This is through a library that, uh, even found on the forums and a project that he found on the Kaggle community and just connecting those dots, uh, this became a full-time role. I'm sure it took a lot of efforts and talent, but again, if, if you stay true yeah. to your passion, it, it, it can make things happen. I think. No, it, it absolutely. And it was one of those things where it was just like, I was doing it in my 10% time and it was a passion. And I think my boss saw that and yeah, it was, it was, you know, it was pretty interesting though. Like, you know, I was, when I interviewed, I remember seeing the first person who was going to interview me and, and I, I don't, I don't think he's been on, but he's a, a Kaggle Grandmaster G way to you. Um, okay. and he, just brilliant and really lovely guy. And, and, but I didn't know that at the time. And so I, uh, <laughs> I had this interview scheduled with a Kaggle Grandmaster, you know, as the gatekeeper for this role, that was my dream role. And I thought, Oh my God, what I, like, I literally like, we sent my, we sent my son out to my grand to my parents and I spent the weekend studying everything, reviewing everything, going over everything, really diving in. But at the end of the day, he was super sweet and really lovely to talk to. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it was not as, it was not the scary interview I was <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, and now I'm at NVIDIA and I'm, I'm loving it. It's been amazing. Can you tell us more about what a day in your life at NVIDIA Applied Research looks like? Do you get to test ray tracing on games and <laughs> what problems are you currently working on? Yeah, so I'm pretty focused. Uh, I'm working on the Rapids team sort of as a, a, an extension to the Rapids. Um, and I think we'll get into Rapids in a little bit. But my day to day is a mix of kind of uh, coordinating with my team and organizing, you know, what projects we're going to work on. We've got a new series of projects and a new team kind of booting up. So we're, we're you know, trying to figure out the roadmap, figure out prioritization. Um, some of it involves communicating with other groups. So, you know, uh, I'm very interested in recommenders. So I met with Facebook last week to talk about the DLRM project and, uh, you know, to see about submissions there. Um, I spent bulk of yesterday working on, a, they call it an RFC, it's Request for Contributions uh, for a TensorFlow community for uh, this project called DLPack. Um, and it's sort of this- I think you opened up a PR so people, I'll also have that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you need to send this with PR, but it essentially, and uh, maybe it's a good time to get into it. So uh, um, Rapids is like the, this, this amazing kind of, it, it's it's the Python ecosystem on GPU, mm -hmm. uh, and there's there's a huge team. There's 75 engineers full time, you know, uh, working on this, developing out uh, equivalents to Scikit-Learn, equivalents to um, you know to a bunch of graph libraries, equivalents to signal processing libraries, uh, and the the one that I leverage and make use of the most is um, is a library called QDF, which is equivalent to Pandas. Um, okay. And when I say equivalent, it's, you know, th there's, we don't have full coverage yet, but there's, there's a matching API. It's really, you know, meant to be at the end of the day, plug and play. Like you'd be able to take your code in pandas and with very minimal changes kind of, you know, in, in many cases, you know, import QDF as PD will work <laughs> in, yeah. um, you know, in, in uh, a lot of code. Um, and it, so it's this data frame library accelerated on the GPU. 
um, you know, NVIDIA is like the, the, what we're trying to do is, is sell GPUs. And so, you know, if we can get people to do data framework and, you know, I mean, part of it is it's really just well suited to it. Um, you know, in most ETL use cases or most uh, data transform use cases like Kaggle, um, we've got a couple examples there or the Rexus example that I've, I, I, I guess we'll get a chance to link hopefully. Um, yep. We generally see about a 10 X speed up in the pre-processing of mm -hmm. the, the data. So um, that's huge. You know, when you're talking about taking a data set that takes a data process and you can process it, you know, in, in a couple hours or, yep. you know, um, something that would take you a few hours and you can get that down to a few minutes. It's, I mean, that's the sweet spot we're aiming for where, you know, instead of, instead of having to like set up a run to generate the data you need for your model and, you know, and then walk away and go get some coffee and read a paper and talk to your coworker and then come back and see and realize that, Oh, damn it. I, you know, I put the wrong line of code in here and now it's grabbing this wrong variable on, yeah. you, know, you know, there's something <laughs> wrong with the data and you got to go back and you restart it. And you do that three times and, and the day's over and you go home and you come back and you try that. Instead, we want to get it down to like, you type it in and you immediately get that back that you're wrong. Mm. And then you type it in again and you, you know, like if we can make that cycle so much faster, then yep. you can be, you know, not even like three or five or you can be 10 or a hundred times more efficient at the end of the day. If you, if you can, you know, iterate more quickly um, and try more things. And so, so you're not limited by your GPU power per se, but essentially the library is sort of holding you back right now. Yeah, I mean, the, the the amazing thing is, you know, you, 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 so you, you take this code that was sort of um, designed to, to do the pre processing that you want to do in pandas to get your data cleaned and ready for the yep. model. And, and, you know, and a lot of that's like categorical um, optimizations and things like that. And you, you know, this is stuff that you have to do to get your data ready. Anyway, and most data scientists, they're probably spending more time doing that than they are doing model building end of the yep. day right because it's just like it takes a lot of time to clean data mm. um, and if we can make that more efficient you already have the gpu you're using it for training your deep learning model anyway yeah why aren't you using it for this and so <laughs> you know this a lot of brilliant people and a lot of hard work has gone into building it up to the point where it's at um, mm -hmm. and i'm able to step in at this stage and leverage and it's like even in the the nine months or ten months i've been at nvidia it's been a transformation in terms of what it can do. Um, and it's pretty amazing to see now, you know, what you can do with, with the library um, to the point where, so the, the role that I came on to do and part of you know, like my, my team initially was the rapids plus deep learning team. Okay. And so our role was to basically look at interoperability between the different deep learning frameworks. Mm -hmm. um, and so we started with PyTorch. Um, Fast AI is built on PyTorch. It's, you know, uh, PyTorch is one of my favorite uh, frameworks, um, not to play favorites, but, uh, but I love it. I enjoy working in PyTorch. <laughs> and so we looked there and there, you know, there was a bunch of interoperability frameworks like this DL pack, um, you know, and so we looked at how to basically pass data back and forth between the Rapids library and, and these others using DL pack. So we're working on that for TensorFlow now, trying to get them to adopt it officially. There's actually a, a package that will do it already kind of outside the bounds that one of the, the uh, co-authors of my RFC developed. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, in order to be able to do this um, internally, it would be, you know, it'd be a lot easier and, and, and more elegant if we can kind of integrate it into TensorFlow. And the mm -hmm. reason why we want to do this is you can imagine um, like once you have this data in the GPU and you're doing data frame processing on it, and you're kind of manipulating the data and getting it ready. It's currently sitting on the GPU, right? Yeah. So and then you don't want to send it back to the CPU and back to the GPU again. Exactly. This, it doesn't make sense. And that's yeah. like, there's a big, uh, there's a lot of work that's kind of been built around that. Um, you know, and QML and, and a bunch of the other libraries kind of work along the same lines. This is like, you get you spend a lot of time getting the data to the GPU now. Like now that it's there, why don't you like keep it on the GPU as much as possible? Yeah, right? and so makes but sense. it allows you to do some pretty cool things nowadays. Like you can literally you can take data midstream from PyTorch, pull it out, do some data frame operations on your batch, push it back in, and and continue on. And the transfer back of the training is almost instantaneous. Yeah, you can. I mean, you can do it anywhere. It's it's okay. It's amazing. Interesting. Um, 
And, and so it lets you do some, some things that you can't quite do in PyTorch. I mean, generally you can do them anyway in, in PyTorch. Mm -hmm. these. So we, we don't tend to use it that often in that context. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so the interoperability what, side of it is, you know, is a big part of what I do um, or what I, what I did in the past, yeah. What NumPy is to PyTorch uh, will be what Pandas will be to uh, Rapids in, in, exactly. in a short way. Got yeah, it. and there's you know there's there's a, a bunch of different kind of frameworks that are interoperable with, um, and and Fastai is one of the frameworks. Actually, I worked with uh, Sylvan to kind of ex, you know get the the basically make sure that that the interoperability and all the functionality was there, and he was you know he's aware of it. He did all the heavy lifting really to to make this thing work in the mm -hmm. context of Fastai. So if you check out the Fastai version too, there's actually a Rapids version for the tablet preprocessing. Okay. Um, and part of what I did, this is I, like this is kind of a tangent, but I think a really interesting one in my mind. Um, you know, being at NVIDIA, let me step back and look at projects that I wouldn't be able to look at in other contexts. And one, like this is where the research part kind of begins to come in in my mind is, you know, when I was working at Realtor or at Plenty of Fish or you know, in, in any role where you're working for a company, there's like there's this sort of bottom line where you're trying to like you're, you're chasing a problem and you solve that problem and you're done and you move on to the next one and if there's a blocker like you don't you don't you're not thinking about the big picture solving it for every company in the world and you know in the context of rapids in the context of deep learning that's really what i was you know tasked to do and so part of what i looked at when i started doing that was the pytorch data loader if you look at it was built like way back when and people were doing images. That was like, that was what the data loaders be used for. And so the mechanism mm -hmm. of the data loader, the traditional data loader is to grab data, you know, do some pre-processing on it, load it into a batch, right. grab data, do some pre-processing on it, load it into a batch. But if that batch is just a single line of tabular data, it's not like, it doesn't it's make not sense. efficient to do that. It's not, it doesn't make any sense, right? And so, you know, we've, we've rewritten the PyTorch data loader. Uh, we're working on, a, you know, packaging that up and making it nice and clean. Um, we do pre-processing of the data to get it ready for, um, for you know, deep learning models, like calculating yeah. the mean and the standard deviation and, and doing all your normalization of your continuous variables, um, calculating your categorical encodings and doing all of that. And you know, just just all the standard pre-processing for deep learning, we've kind of packaged all that up, and we're building a pre-processing framework for tabular data. Um, the it. other really cool thing that you can do with Rapids is like they've, so they've accelerated like the the loading of things like Parquet files. So you, you can take a Parquet file and do um, like a, a a byte, like it's it, it, Parquet is is compressed byte encoded data. Okay. And so you can load that compressed byte encoded data directly onto the GPU and decompress it on the GPU. And when it comes to tabular and comes to these types of problems, like the, the transfer of data is actually a significant portion of the problem, mm -hmm. right? Like when you're talking about an image, there's more compute than ETL or than, than data transfer. But when you're talking about tabular data, generally speaking, the models are pretty small. It's like simple feed forward models and betting lookups. So mm -hmm. you have to go massively parallel with batch sizes, which we, you know, we're starting to play around with, but you also have to have a fast way of getting the data there and actually compress parquet is, is making a big difference. So is that the standard way of uh, storing the data or? It's not now, like most, most data sets you find are in CSV format. I really think that's going to change because it's like it, it, the difference between loading CSV and loading parquet is anywhere between five and 20 times. Well, okay. So uh, zooming out a bit on the Rapids project, <laughs> could you tell us more about the Rapids project? Because there are many libraries inside of the organization on GitHub, so to speak, that are being developed. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's this really growing um, thing. And so there's, you know, the, the new ones that I know about, the, the big projects we're working on right now, there's this really interesting one called KuSignal, which is, you know, signal processing on GPU. There's KuGraph, which is, you know, this is graph library. Um, there's the, the QML is like, QML is a whole series of, of, of opt, uh, you know, algorithms and optimizations as well. Um, and then there's QDF is kind of the, the, the data frame, the bulk, you know, the, the, the core library in my mind. Um, 
it, because generally the data formats that are feeding these other models are kind of coming in that format. And so it's this interoperability that we talked about that you know that you're allowed, to, you, know, you could do the data manipulation you need to do and then sort of take the data into those formats. Um, there's work going on right now to, and, and I'm not the, the expert or the person to talk to about this, but um, they're working on UCX, which is like a communication protocol for fast communication between devices. So okay. the idea here is like, some of the coolest things I've seen that that um, Rapids has done, and these these are kind of older achievements that they were, you know, back when I started, they could do this. But um, like the GPU version of XGBoost is something that that the the team spent a lot of time working on. And yeah, there's this Fannie Mae data set that's several terabytes of data. Like it's 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 massive. It's this huge, huge, huge data set. And they basically they developed the system where you know you 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 do XGBoost in parallel where you split the data. So it's, it's data level parallelism. You split the data across and each sort of worker generates trees that okay. come back. Um, and, and so you, you know, you're, you're parallelizing the whole thing. Each tree is getting kind of different data. So it's, it's um, this is the GPU hist version, but it scales pretty much linearly um, to the point where you can do this like multi terabyte data set on, you know, on, uh, a large cluster of GPUs in, I think it was 45 seconds. It's under a minute. And it's it, like to run it on a single CPU takes like weeks, months. Yeah. You know, it's, it's crazy how fast you can make this thing, you know, when you have the hardware behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, there's some amazing work being done there. And the team is really you know, like iterating fast and developing new things every day to the point where I, you know, I have trouble keeping up <laughs> what they're all up to. It's, it's what, really cool. What I'm able to understand is these many, uh, so to speak, modules can function independently and it does make sense to keep them independent, but you can also pretty conveniently connect them depending on the problems. It, exactly, have. exactly. And it's, you know, especially when you when it makes sense <laughs> to pass the data, you've got this kind of, you know, sequence of, of models. Um, QDF is, is, like I said, it's kind of the glue that, that things pass back and forth between generally speaking, but you can certainly pass data between, between the different models very efficiently and easily. Got it. What's your take on uh, deep learning in Tableau? Because that's yeah. not the go-to situation for now. And there's a question from LinkedIn as well. Uh, there's a heavy feature engineering that goes into it. Do you see that changing over time? Uh, your thoughts yeah. on that? Um, so, I mean, I'm going to cite Jean-Francois uh, from, from a couple weeks ago on the podcast. Um, and uh, like really many of the things that you want to do with feature engineering, you, you just can't do automatically with models. I think that's hard. Yeah. Um, although I think you can probably automate a lot of those feature engineering methods. Um, and I think that, you know, setting those up as pre um, precursor methods is interesting. Mm. Um, I know like right now, Right now it's a bit of a wash like i think you know deep learning can almost compete with some of these other methods i don't think it's it's fully competitive if you talk at, like at the highest levels of kaggle yeah the, there's like generally having a deep learning to method, model to your ensemble is going to boost your performance because it's learning something slightly different but it's not going to be your best performing single model on a tabular competition right. um i i think part of that is is like jean, jean francois said um um is it jean francois Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The grandmaster <laughs> CPMB. Yes. yes Many yes, people would exactly. know my CPMB. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, the scale of the data matters, right? And so one of the things we're working on right now um, for tabular and for recommender systems in general, which is you know it's my background and one of my passions, um, is a larger than CPU memory data loader. So basically building a data loader that can kind of scale the data out to these terabyte level data sets to efficiently and easily load them. Because it's always an issue when you're trying to like get the data onto the GPU. If, if you expand beyond CPU memory, like you can't, you can't just load the data frame in and then transfer over the batches. You've got you've to think about this intelligently. And so we're building this larger than CPU memory data loader um, and we'll be releasing that sometime in the next little while. Um, to help scale the scale to the level of data that you know that maybe would help for tabular. Um, yeah. The other thing that I think, like I would say, honestly, I don't feel like tabular has seen nearly the level of effort 
the other modalities has seen. Like if you if you look at the amount of work that's gone into you know images or NLP, I don't think we're you know we're even at one one hundredth of that, right? Mm. So I'm excited over the next few years with my team to start really digging into the research side of this and looking at you know this, there is some interesting work that's gone on like um, uh, AutoInt and TabNet and there's a few yep. like you know recent papers that kind of they've um, they've leveraged attention models and you know like auto is an interesting one where they combine like first order second order third order combination of the input variables in order to generate through attention to generate you know these more sophisticated input features and it, it, those types of architectures really appeal to me and i think things like that and things like you know automating techniques for feature engineering like um you know uh chris um Diot from kaggle yeah um, his recent solution uh, to the uh, the IEEE. I think so. I the yeah, yeah IEEE would be the tabular one. <laughs> yeah. So um, his recent solution there, where you know where he's doing this like this grouping of multiple like categorical variables to find the the um, the um, find the card holders and mm -hmm. then kind of generating continuous features off the categoricals that are related with that. Um, something like that, you know, we can do that automatically through pre-processing, but I'm also interested in maybe looking at like, what do architectures look like that kind of think in that way that, you know, that allow the model to discover data in that way. It's a little bit hard when you think about it in that context, because really, like we, we used to do this at Realtor when we were looking at housing, um, you know, we, we talk about features in the context of, or like houses in the context of where they fit in the distribution, right? Like, you know, if you talk about, you know, all of the different relative features of the house and then, you know, for any given feature, where does that sort of, where do the other continuous features like in particular price and square footage and things like that, where, like where does it sit within that distribution of all the available, you know, generally speaking within a market in that context. Yeah. But, you know, that kind of representation is an interesting one and something that, you know, you should be able to automatically generate and, and those types of features and the differences between, you know, where that individual entry sits relative. It's like, it's not something that's easy for the neural net to necessarily learn. Um, mm -hmm. Auto encoders help with that. Like, you, you know, if you've got the denoising auto encoder and you're changing your data, it's randomizing, it has to learn the relationship between. So it learns like, you know, two bedroom versus three bedroom and what that means for the other features. And it can learn to recognize like, wait a minute, this is a really funny two bedroom because it's, you know, got these other extra features. Yeah. But it generally, generally speaking, it's learning to ignore those funny extra features. So it's doing its predictions <laughs> and not like take advantage of them. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, I don't think it's there yet, but like I said, I don't think the research has been done. And mm -hmm. I'm really excited to see, you know, and to talk with people who are doing that kind of research. So please, by all means, if you are doing research in the tabular and you've got, you know, interesting models or explorations you've done, reach out. Um, I think those, you know, we talked earlier about the, the loss functions when I talked about that project. And I think yep. there's some question about, you know, which data sets and which loss functions. And I think uh, Recommender Systems shares this issue as well, where mm -hmm. it's, you know, it, it's hard to evaluate one model to another because they're comparing across different data sets. They're using different loss functions. So Rexis has better loss functions like NDCG and, and mean average precision and that kind of thing. But, you know, hey. Yeah, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of potential and a lot of future. I don't think we're I don't think we're there yet, but I agree it's not it, it's it's certainly not at the level of, of LGBM quite yet. It's pretty close if you tune it properly though. How do you see the dots connecting? For example, once we're able to figure out how to train everything on the GPU, we need to do the inference on the CPUs. So there might be a disconnect there, or how do you see that happening? So uh, it's. Uh, I'm happy you brought that up because I think there's you, right now there is a lot of inference happening on the CPU. Um, I think most inference is probably happening yep, on the yep. CPU, especially for recommender systems. Um, NVIDIA has been working the last little while to really develop inference based like, architectures. Uh, and so, you know, we're starting. Dali to see would the, be another example that I could think of. So, Dali is like Dali is a. Um, is a mechanism for doing like G JPEG compression on the GPU and that helps like fast data loading for images. Uh, but mm -hmm. there are like, there's literally hardware architectures like T4 is the sort of the inference serving card. Um, okay. 
I hope that's the external name for it. That's the one that I know of, the name I know it by. But, um, you know, we're, we're looking at, like we're seeing customers start to shift over to GPU in very, like very few customers are, um, but that's a big part of what we're, we're pushing towards and really trying to kind of show and demonstrate. And the ones that are, are seeing, you know, improvements in their costs, like their costs are going down significantly because the GPUs are able to leverage um, that, you know, the parallelism, like one of the things we can do on these T4s is through the, the TensorRT inference server, which we built, it's kind of like the equivalent of TensorFlow serving. So it's this, um, you know, this fully functioning uh, RPC based uh, inference server. And it, you know, it, it takes the data in, it, you know, it solves, it returns, you can, you can define pre-processing functions, you can define post-processing functions and all the other stuff. Um, it's really powerful, really beautiful, elegant solution. Um, and, and what I'm working on right now or what we're working on in the next little while is going to be to integrate rapids into that so we can do some of the rapid stuff Interesting. Kind of in between for pre-processing all on GPU, right? Um, but they're like the hardware solutions are, you know, are faster and they're cheaper for the customers that are going there. So I think right now the prevailing, and, and, and I talk to people all the time where like, you know, inference happens on CPU. That's like, that's just where it happens. I think that's going to change over the next, you know, two to five years. Um, yeah. And I'm hoping to be a big part of that. Like, I think part of it is the tooling and I want to make it, you know, easy to do tabular and easy to do recommender systems on GPU. That's a big part of, uh, part of what my team's working on right now. I think it again speaks to being on the cutting edge of research where you talking about something that many of the listeners would think, oh, this doesn't make sense. And <laughs> eventually the trend might catch up. So a common question again is how does a research pipeline look like? So you're explaining all of these amazing problems that now make sense in this conversation, but how do you come up with these ideas to maybe explore uh, an idea that may or may not work or how do you come up with the go-to steps for these things? Yeah, I mean, so some of it has been like as an example, the the rewriting of the PyTorch data loader, um, you know, is one method where essentially what I ran into was this wall of a challenge. And sometimes this is an interesting thing that I like to sometimes do, or that you, that you sometimes encounter naturally, is like there's this constraint that just forces you down a particular path. So the PyTorch data loader you know, what I was trying to do initially was build this data loader that was efficient using like memory that's on the GPU. So we've got this, like we've got a lot of memory on GPU. We may as well, you know, if we can leverage that, put the data on the GPU, you know. But what I found was if the data is on the GPU already and we're doing these rapids calls, like those rapids calls are happening using CUDA. At the, mm-hmm. And CUDA and forking to do multi-processing don't play nice because like when you when you call CUDA you're sort of generating this sort of this um, like this space uh, or this instance I'm, I'm describing it terribly but you're, you're like you're, you're basically creating this this sort of um, reference that lets the, the card know that you own this sort of this particular part of memory and not to dereference it you know mm-hmm. without your your permission right Got and, it you can't fork that out and give that sort of that key to everybody because then you get these collisions on the, in the, in the data spaces. Um, and so I was running into this with rapids where like the multi-processing CPU version was faster because uh, than having the memory directly on the GPU already, because I couldn't use multi-processing. And that made me step back and go, okay, well, if I can't do multi-processing, I really need to figure out a different solution. And that led me to like, to dig into the data loader. And that's not something that I would have done probably before fast AI or before, you know, but really like to step back and say, what does a data loader do? What, mm-hmm. like, what exactly is the code doing? And I looked in and there's like, there was a lot of multi-processing code and it was very complex, but then I got down to the heart of the like, If you're not multi-processing, this thing's an iterator. It's like, I can build an iterator. I can build mm-hmm. an iterator that grabs all the data at once. Cause that's more efficient. And let's see how fast that is. And I built it and it was, you know, 10 to 15% faster than the base data loader. And in the context of fast AI, where they're doing a bunch of other things, it was a hundred times faster or like oh. 80 to hundred times faster. Okay. You know, and so we took like in the Rexus 15 X model where we were, you know, or 15 X project. Um, we, we took the, the data loader from 56% of the time to 2% of the time. 
well, you know, by by like restructuring it by doing the tensor transformations all up front by loading the data all up front by doing the shuffle yeah. kind of once per epoch and by grabbing contiguous blocks <laughs> right and so it's just like if i hadn't hit that wall and been blocked yeah. i don't think i necessarily would have thought to dig in there right i think and it always goes back to that question of jeremy where like smart researchers would i ask why is this happening and not just okay this is how it is yeah yeah and sometimes you have to hit that wall to 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 ask well why but but yeah no that's that's exactly it and then the other is you, the other set of things that sometimes comes up is just you hit this critical mass where like with that data loader and and sort of a bunch of research that's gone into large batch training and a few kind of tweaks and solutions here and there suddenly we're you know 10 or 15x faster on the GPU and that makes us go back and look and revisit that question of like well is it faster to train on CPU? Does it like, does it make sense? Um, <laughs> yeah. No, no, it actually, it, it doesn't. Um, we were just doing it wrong originally and, you know, and, and dealing with all these limitations. And once we fix those limitations and, and kind of, you know, push past that hump, and I'm hoping that's what's going to happen with the tabular deep learning. And we're going to be able to come up with some interesting solutions there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it's like, I think, you know, severe restrictions sometimes allow allow you to see past or like to force you to push past things. And then, you know, seeing a bunch of things kind of fall into place, it's really kind of happened quite naturally. Um, you know, once once you're past, like what, once you've made a few improvements, just stepping back and looking at the system and seeing like, okay, these things have suddenly changed. And sometimes that's coming from external sources. Like it's it's interesting to step back and see like, okay, now that we've got, you know, like Radom and Mish and, and cyclical learning rates and all these other things kind of, I wonder what that means in the field of, you know, uh, of X, Y, Z. And, and, and yeah. that can sometimes, like I, I have these interconnections sometimes, you know, I try and keep a notebook and write them down and, and I don't always get back to the ones that I want to work on, but I, you know, I've got these like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we took this idea from this paper and, you know, applied it in this context or this setting and that should, you know, yeah, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Again, uh, coming to your recent research uh, titled Recommender System Training 15X with Rapid A, Rapid AI, we'll have it linked in the description. Uh, was I was going through the paper and was done by a distributed team. So could you maybe yeah. tell us how does a task look uh, like that? How do you distribute a work, track your ideas and sync with the team? Yeah, so I mean, Rapids, the whole team is distributed. I've got, you know, team members okay. all over the world, the particular core of the Rapids DL team, you know, some of them are borrowing kind of from the Rapids core team. Um, and, you know, I've got people as far as away as Copenhagen, who actually Rex just happened to be there this year, so I got to go visit and, and have a dinner with him. And, and that was nice to meet in person. Uh, but most of my team members I've never met. Um, okay. <laughs> and so... Uh, it's it's remote work and I, I particularly love it. I'm like I'm you know, I'm able to go down and have coffee and kind of interact with my boys and, and you know and help my wife out the door when she's dealing with a four year old who's having a tantrum and you know it's it's <laughs> like <laughs> it, yeah. it helps out, right? And 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 I I like it and sometimes it means working late at night to make up for the time lost and, and that side of things. But it suits my my lifestyle. In terms of interacting with a team abroad and kind of keeping track I think, you know, if you look at the different things that were happening there, like some of them were split up, like the, all of the work on the kernel was done by Matt, the guy in Copenhagen, who's you know, brilliant and he's done a bunch of really interesting work for us. And, and it's just, it comes from like the team and the people at NVIDIA are just brilliant and everyone is, you know, like I, I, I've never worked with such a talented team and I'm really, really I feel so blessed every day to be able to work with them because I can give a very high level idea or high level concept, you know, and, and, and little more than that. And with a few kind of back and forth iterations, what comes back is better than I ever imagined. <laughs> right. And so it's like, when you're working with people of that caliber, it makes it very easy to, you know, to hand off something that's, you know, that's, the seed of an idea and and then hopefully when they come back it's like they either come back with something better than you imagine or they come back with some really interesting questions that help guide and direct and, and, and move you forward um and that's been sort of how the teams worked is it's I'm, I'm definitely not the right person to talk to about how to how to work a, 
like a standard software project or a team where you know everybody's kind of interweaving their work. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I come from a data science background. I'm not a software guy per se. I'm definitely not the best programmer on the team. In fact, I'd probably put myself at the worst at this point, <laughs> um, just because of how talented people are and and because I'm I'm a little bit rusty. I've been doing a lot more, you know, management and and visioning and kind of in setting up the team and. And, and the research and kind of keeping up to date on you know, what's going on in the research community. So, Got it. What best advice do you have for remote work people who are uh, currently getting started or have been doing that? Any <laughs> things that you picked up that have increased your productivity? It's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I honestly need to do some research on it. Like I, <laughs> for, for me, it's uh like I said, there's there's times when I'm you know downstairs helping my wife out the door and and I eat lunch with my kids every day and and you know it's it's that's my priority and it means that some evenings I'm working at night and not watching Netflix or whatever so mm -hmm. that's that's fine by me though it's not like I, I I don't I don't mind it or begrudge it in any way I love I love the work and I love my family and that's sort of what I do right now. And that's, that's the sacrifice I've made to, to have a family, <laughs> which I think, you know, most parents will tell you it's, it's a sacrifice and it's worth it. Right. It's I, yeah. I'm, when the boys get a little older, I'm hoping to be able to, you know, do a little more and, and be able to you know, participate. I try and, and this is something I've been, my wife bugs me about all the time is, you know, finding hobbies that get me away from the computer screen. Right. It's like it's, <laughs> deep learning is such a passion for me. Yeah. It's like, I, you know, I want to sit down and code something up at the end of the day, potentially. Um, but it's hey, also, it's important to step back and kind of take some time away from the computer and go for a walk or, you know, um, try and get out there and do some <laughs> painting or biking or whatever else. Yeah. That's great advice. <laughs> now, zooming out a bit on NVIDIA, so to speak, NVIDIA Research has been working on many amazing projects. Any things that you are excited about outside of the Rapids team? Any upcoming projects that you could maybe give us a little hint about? <laughs> I, I can't really tease on anything that I know about. Um, it's like NVIDIA is 15,000 people. Um, yeah. and so it, <laughs> there's a lot of really amazing projects. Um, and honestly, I, most of them, I find out about at the same time you would, right. Um, and it, I'm okay. proud that it was, you know, it's happening at NVIDIA, um, but I'm, I'm pretty focused on tabular and that's one of the, you know, like one of the pieces of advice in terms of staying on top of the field for me that, that really resonated and that I followed is, um, you know, trying to stick to a domain that I can kind of keep up with. Right. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I, the domain I picked is like tabular and recommender systems and, you know, the work that's happening in those, in the context of those two things, I can try and keep up with and, and drive and move forward. And, you know, and I, I certainly like, I'll check out Helena's GAN work and I'll, you know, uh, I'll be amazed by the new, you know, the new stuff that NVIDIA is doing in that, domain and I've always like the, the style GAN stuff that came out was like brilliant and blew me away but I you know <laughs> that was my yeah. first time seeing it so yeah it's I, I'm not as aware of everything going on I'm hoping to get a connection like I, I've only been at the company for about 10 months um, I'm going to NeurIPS in a week and and there's a bunch of people from the company going from you know more connected on the research side so I'm hoping to get a chance to connect with them regularly like I'm it's one of the disadvantages of working from home and not in in the head offices I don't bump into these people <laughs> at all I get a chance to talk about my research or learn about theirs right so yeah yeah now common prevailing sentiment if I may is that deep learning or even deep learning research per se involves a lot of computing resources, a lot of NVIDIA GPUs. What's your take on that? Any fast fellow that wants to experiment on just GCP instances or for example, on a single GPU, any advice is there? Yeah, I think, I mean, compute resources certainly help. And if you want to scale things to, you know, to production level, you definitely need, um, you need to think about resources you're running on but in the for the most part i mean when i was first learning deep learning i i got a i had a single 1080 ti 
um, which was a splurge and, you know, and, and, and a really powerful card for me at the time. I'm, I'm now totally spoiled and then I do most of my work <laughs> on V100s with 32 gigs of RAM. And, and it's like, it's a world of difference to have that much memory and to be able to, you know, and to have the NV link connections between the cards and everything else, yes. <laughs> and fast data links. And it's like, fast hardware is a pleasure to work on and it's really amazing what you can do. And, and at the end of the day, you know, it, it's price so that you're if you're able to make use of them you're you're saving yourself money by using the high-end cards generally speaking um for a hobby the other cards are totally fine and there's nothing you know there's nothing wrong with a 1070 um, the only challenge you're going to run into is fitting models in there and yeah. i think one of the things that i try and do and part of what i've worked on is so like the the data loader that i'm working on the larger than cpu memory data loader Right. Um, it also has an in GPU memory and an in CPU memory component to it. And part mm -hmm. of why I've worked on those three components and not just built the in GPU memory, which is the fastest, like it's definitely the fastest to just load all your data into GPU memory and, and operate right out of it right out of GPU memory. But I recognize and, and you know, like coming from the fast AI background, like not everybody has access to a GPU with 32 gigs of RAM. And if that's mm -hmm. like if that's what I target in terms of you know, who's going to be able to use my work, then I don't think, like, I, I don't think <laughs> many people are going to be able to use it. But beyond that, I'm a big believer that, like, if somebody can use it at, you know, in a, in a 11 gig card, and they can really get some value from it, and then they can show that to their boss, and their boss sees the value in it, that may lead to the sale of a 32 gig card, because that's how it's going to run efficiently and cost effectively in their business. So yeah. like it, I don't think it makes sense to target a particular architecture off the bat. I think we want to be supporting, you know, people right the way through the spectrum. And I, I'm always like we, we literally in, in some cases, like for our pre processing pipeline that we developed, we had a pre-processing pipeline that worked when everything fit in GPU memory and we developed that and it worked great. And for data sets that fit in GPU memory, it was brilliant and it's super fast, like, <laughs> you know, in, in seconds. And then we stepped back and said, okay, what happens if you only have this much memory? What happens if you only have this much? And then we've got it down to this point where we're able to iterate over the data in smaller chunks of memory so that anybody with any size card, and we literally were like taking these 32 gig cards and capping them at like, you know, 11 gigs to be able to iterate through the data and make sure that it fits because yeah. it's important that everybody can make use of this. It's not going to be useful to the, you know, to the community at large, then I, I don't think it's worth working on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, given the explosive rate at which all of the research comes out, I know you uh, mentioned this on your blog post as well. How do you keep up with the research and uh, any things that you picked up that help you read to the papers yeah. or just keeping up with the research twitter's big i mean i think you know i think we probably got to know each other more through twitter than than anything else because we're yeah. constantly posting back and forth and it's a great way to keep in touch with people and have a bunch of conversations and you know i try and amplify things that i find interesting and if you follow me you'll probably find most of the stuff is fast ai related because that's who i follow but that's you know, true to I, anyone from the fast AI community uh, that's one thing true to all the Twitter profiles from fast day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, I mean, it's a family. You want to support your family members. It's amazing to see the work they're doing, which is cool. I, I, I have a lot of people in the Rexus side that I follow and, and uh, a lot of just sort of research in general. Um, I read a lot of papers um, and like uh, to give you an idea, I have this kind of well. stuff in the <laughs> inbox. That's that's on top of this okay. box of papers <laughs> that I read last year, and you know, and there's like three sitting in the printer that I printed well. today. And um, <laughs> for and, the audio listeners, there's a video version we're we'll <laughs> looking at. Oh, yeah, yeah. I guess um, so. I the the trick for reading papers, I find, and and I, I'm actually out of. I, I don't always do this and I'm right now kind of indulging myself in reading a science fiction book uh, okay. in the evenings, but um, I've been in the habit of reading before I go to bed uh, for a long time and trying to, you know, cut down screen time before, before I go to sleep, it really helps me sleep. So, uh, you know, for a long time, I've been in a pattern of reading papers at night. Um, and I, I find that makes a huge difference. If you can get through one paper a night, you know, I think I probably read 200 papers this past year, just, through that pattern. Um, That's good. And, yeah, and it's, you know, it, 
you don't like some of the papers I get through the abstract a few pages and then I'm like, you know what, this is, you know, too complex for me. This is not my interest. This is not what I thought it was. And I, you know, I set it aside and some of them I dig through and I, I spend, you know, a couple nights on them and, and, and often if it's interesting that night, I'll go back in the morning and I'll you know, start really digging in and doing some research and trying to figure out if I can find the source code and, and take a look through and understand a bit better what's going on. And that's where like, there's so much going on and, and in particular in recommender systems and tabular, like it's lagging so far behind NLP um, where the architectures are like, the, the concepts are kind of similar if you think about them in a particular way and the architectures are so far ahead in the NLP side of things <laughs> that keeping up to date there is, is pretty interesting. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, that's, that's the biggest thing that I've done. And then, then the MP3 side of things, um, I have a lot of YouTube channels that I follow that are really brilliant, like um, the PyData channel, um, Vector Institute's pretty good now. They're mm -hmm. rarer, but um, yeah, I mean, if you can only, you just sort of start searching and finding them. And, and I have a, a, a sort of a YouTube account that's kind of centered around that. Mm -hmm. I, I don't get to it as often as I want, but I, I try and, you know, I spend enough time in front of the computer watching <laughs> and doing things that it's hard to sit at the end of the day. And I really, honestly, I wish there was an easy way to export from, you know, from YouTube to the audio because mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> it'd be a lot easier if I could do that and just listen to it as a podcast. But. Maybe that's, that's something that I'm actually working on for the Chai Time Data Science podcast. So some uh, research ideas will come up on the podcast that will be covered, but Maybe in a while now that I have a full-time job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Congratulations, by the way. It's so awesome to Thank see you. all the different places that people, you know, the Fast AI alums have gone. It's it's pretty amazing. There's people pretty much everywhere now. It Thank you so like. much. Yeah. I think it's, it's one shared sentiment that all of us somehow link this to Fast AI because Fast AI has set off this chain of reactions where we found our passions, Kaggle, blogging, pretty much everything yeah. for me. No, I, I absolutely would not be sitting where I am if I hadn't sort of randomly seen Jeremy's video and gotten really deeply involved in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, coming to job posting, so example, someone who's currently doing fast A or who's just completed fast A, uh, do you think a traditional machine learning background is absolutely necessary or any other advices on how to go about applying for jobs after you complete fast A? Yeah. Um, it's not necessary, but you have to be cognizant that you're going to be competing with people who have that background. You know, so when somebody's somebody outside of the fast AI community is is looking, they're they're going to have a harder time evaluating. And I think the key in my mind, if you really want a career in ML, is to find one of those passion projects. You know, um, like Jason's done, or you know, the 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 deep learning stuff, like come up with something that's really interesting, spend some time really developing a solid portfolio. And, and like Jeremy says, pick one project, and focus on that one project, make that one project awesome yep. before you switch to another one. Cause like a portfolio of a bunch of like, yeah, okay, you can <laughs> write a classifier, you can do regression, you can do a basic NLP thing. It's like, it doesn't show anything other than that you can kind of like follow a blog post along and do, yep. you, know, you know, work your way through that. But like taking a project and moving it beyond what the typical person has done with it and really like diving deeply into it and showing, you know, something that people have never seen before. If you can really do that, you know, and if your code's available on GitHub and you can show that, you know, that you're a solid coder, that you've got, you know, you, you really understand these and then, you know, and then, I certainly don't require, uh, you know, master's or PhD. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for that. And that's a strong indicator because it's people who've done a master's and a PhD have shown they can, you know, dedicate themselves to a project for a chunk of time. They know how to read <laughs> papers, they know how to, and, and like, honestly, that first one is probably the most important thing is like not everybody is suited to like really focusing on one thing for a chunk of time. And if you want to do research or, you know, machine learning in that context, you, you, you kind of need that. Honestly, I, I think it's this way in any field. Like my wife is yeah. a professional dancer and for her, like the, the tenacity of just 
continually being there and sticking it out and going through like the vast majority of people who started in her cohort are not professional dancers there's a bunch that are but it's not everybody who sticks it out and it's i think in the arts it's true i think in in most jobs it's that's very true you know tenacity and really like pushing yourself to to stick with it is is the most important thing and that's where passion really comes in handy i think even speaking for you so you picked up a problem that wasn't really intuitive right so like not everyone was doing deep learning on tabular it still doesn't completely make sense and now you are at nvidia <laughs> thanks thanks to finding that auto encoder problem on kaggle i think that's yeah. what set off the chain reaction for you yeah no absolutely um i want to touch up on another topic uh, your take on ethics because you're also working on uh, tabular data and deep learning so any things that you're cautious about uh, on the ethics side how do you reduce the bias or any advice for the people who might be looking at these problems yeah it's i mean i'm definitely not the expert here it's something that i'm very cognizant of and and you know and i think it's a very important topic i'm excited to see the direction um you know that the things go at the university of san francisco data institute now that rachel's you know come yeah. on there um i feel like i have a lot to learn in the area um i saw you know previous to actually just a few days ago i would have said you know there are techniques out there for ml interpretability and you know and you really have to be cognizant when you you know, analyze your models make sure that they're not kind of um leveraging things that can be you know can be bias inducing and that's you know the solution isn't as simple as just like taking those pieces out of the, you know like you, you can't just take a data set that has male and female out as an example and 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 you know just remove that class and and expect that the model is going to you know going to work um a good indicator and actually this was a, a this came to be from a, a kaggle forum as well uh not particularly in this context but um I think Boyan often does these on the Kaggle forums. Um is uh basically, you know, if if you can so he he does it in the context of predicting train and test set. So if you take yeah. the data set and if you can predict train and test, like the variables that are good at predicting between your train and your test set are are like basically leaky variables and it's not mm -hmm. like they're they're not going to help. You're going to run into issues with uh um with leakage. And similarly, you know, if if you want to remove bias and you take like that that variable that you think is going to be you know biasing your your set and you apply it in this context you know you if if you if you train a model to try and predict that and you're getting anything better than 50% accuracy then there are other confounding factors in your data that are you know that are causing this bias and you need to really think about it i think it varies on the product and you really do need to think about it from a product perspective in terms of like what it is the model's trying to do how the model's going to be used you know the context in which it's going to be used is everything and i think that's you know it comes down to a, the application of machine learning and and, hmm. and that's i think getting more specific i think and then i can speak to being aware of that it's a problem that you need to keep in the back of your head also is a huge factor many people don't even consider that but whatever domain especially in machine learning if you're working on you should have that thought in the back of your head and it might become relevant now or later but yeah. that's what uh, the fast ai folks also really propagate but it's it's something important that i think everyone should be aware of yeah jeremy and rachel have a great um i think it's a couple this one for the machine learning course and then one from from the fast ai uh, the like the basic deep learning course um on ethics and and artificial intelligence there's lots of examples where it it just goes horribly awry yeah. um in ways that you can't even imagine and and it's it's very sad to see and it's this like there's a lot of people that are just sort of you know blind to it and deny it and and there's people who kind of build models based off of these prejudices and it's it's unfortunate that that's the case um, but you know i think as a as a engineer um ethics should be at the forefront of you know of, of our thought when we're building a system or building a building a tool yeah definitely This has been a great conversation. My final yeah. question to you would be: What best advice do you have for someone who's just starting out in machine learning or deep learning? Oh, you, you know the answer to this one. <laughs> Take the fast AI course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, fast AI is is legendary. I mean, it's it's been such an amazing course. I think, um, you know, for me, 
I've gone through all of the all of the coursework that's available. I've done the machine learning course as well. Um, take your time with it. You know, do yep. each subsequent <laughs> year. There's more each time, and you know, don't just shift enter through like Jeremy says. <laughs> it's yeah. it's important to do the programming. So spend some time learning it. You know, make find a passion project, dive in. Um, but yeah, and the the fast AI videos are going to get you excited about working on this. You know, if you're even remotely interested, by the end of it, you're going to be super jazz. And and I think there's a lot of people in the community that, you know, that have gone on to do amazing things, and that's hopefully inspiring to people who you know want to take this path as well. And and yeah, reach out to them. Like hap I'm happy to to talk with people who are kind of on this journey on the forums or wherever. Um, you know, it's it's. Uh, it's that perseverance that really is the key. I think if you if you dedicate yourself to it and you spend the time and you really dive in and you focus, literally anybody can do this. And that's I think the beauty of Jeremy and Rachel's teachings is, you know, it, it, there's people from all sorts of diverse, amazing backgrounds, and and the background you come from brings something to the table. And honestly, like coming from a machine learning background, I, I, I felt a little bit like I was losing out, not having that other background to bring to the table. And I've got photography and some other things that I could bring, but you know, it's, it's having, having an interest in, you know, in, uh, some passion, some, something, some jobs, some like the radiologist he's working with now, or the, like the people who don't have traditional deep learning background you but, but have an expertise in a field or an expertise in some hobby or some understanding like you're going to bring interesting things into the world and that's you know that's more important than somebody who understands machine learning you know tweaking a machine learning model by 0.01 percent yeah <laughs> true uh, i also want to mention your online handles your twitter handle is uh, even underscore always any other platform where you're active and the listeners could follow you Fast AI forum. Uh, I'm at even. I'm not as active there. Um, mm -hmm. I think Twitter's the main one um, these days. That, that okay. That's kind of I keep up with. So find even at even underscore Aldridge. Also linked in the description of the podcast. Uh, thank you so much, even for all of the amazing advices and for joining me on the podcast. Thank you, Sanya. This is lovely. I really enjoyed chatting. I hope we get a chance to talk again soon. Likewise. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.